worked on in Oak Forest as well. Uh, in this presentation, we're going to give an overview of the project statement and describe the analysis we performed. And finally, we're going to give an overall conclusion of the project feasibility. So a quick site description. We are looking at the borrow pit on the Oregon Country Fair property. And as you can see from the maps, the borrow pit is just outside the limits of the city of Venita. So this is a picture we took from our site visit, and it shows the current condition of the borrow pit. Uh, it's currently overrun with reed canary grass and petty royale, and during the winter months, it's inundated with water. So now Lily's going to tell us a little bit more about the problem objectives. All right. So our task was to develop a suitable design for the treatment of the city of Anita wastewater effluent. Um, we have three main goals seen here on the bottom of the screen. Um, one was to reduce the temperature and nutrient load of the waste stream. We wanted to expand the environmental and social outreach for the community. And we wanted to make sure this had a realistic budget. So, one of the first things we had to think about was whether or not this was in accordance with state and federal regulations. Therefore, one of the first steps of our team was to research the laws and permits that were applicable to our project. Um, so, the ODEQ determines pollution levels under the total maximum daily load for nutrients, bacteria, and temperature. The EPA also has laws for natural resources and the environment, including criteria for water and wastewater infrastructure. We thought of talking to those at the Longtown Watershed Council, I mentioned before, would be a great idea because this is within the watershed and pertinent to water health. Um, this is a special place. It's a unique site, one of the oldest archaeological sites in Oregon, therefore being within archaeological restrictions and under the State Historic Preservation Office was something we had to consider. And we had to think about the Tangent Highway 126 for cost material tracking. So we're going to go into a technical summary now. I'm going to talk about the TMDL restrictions, the retention time, the overall wetland design, and our wetland energy balance. And then Sarah's going to talk about nitrogen, piping, and materials and excavation. So our TPO requirements, like mentioned before, um, the temperature limits into the long term are 17.8 degrees Celsius during the summer months, and we wanted to keep our nitrogen limit under 10 parts per million for in case of groundwater entry. Um, there, we're keeping these in mind, we calculated the retention time for the wetland using a maximum received flow rate of 2,650 meters cubed per day and a water wetland height of 0.75 meters. Um, these gave us a retention time of two and a half days, which is good because it tells us that our water is in the wetland long enough for us to actually treat the nitrogen. So this led to our wetland design. We have two designs shown here, a double channel and our single channel design. The benefits of a double channel is that one of the channels may be taken out for maintenance and testing. However, this is at a much higher cost and maybe not economically feasible. Therefore, we recommend going a single channel at a width of 30 meters with trees bordering the other side. Um, shown here also on the chart is the aspect ratio and the sinuosity. Um, the ratio is the length to width ratio, and the sinuosity tells us the curvature of the stream. So one of our main goals was to treat the temperature coming into the wetland. Um, doing this, we had to consider what are the energy flows going into and out of the wetland. Um, shown here Top is a schematic showing our main energy flows coming in of sun radiation, and there's long wave radiation going in and out. Um, we thought one of the biggest removals would be evaporation, also known as latent heat, um, and sensible heat, which is the heat that you can feel, and that's highly affected by humidity. Um, again, the ground conduction was assumed to be negligible compared to the rest of the terms here, so we just ignored it. Um, so I tried to consider a worst case scenario of a hot summer day with cloud cover at night and we estimated approximate values for what that might look like in the energy flow. In doing so we got that the energy would be able to remove around 90 watts per meter squared. We compared this to what's coming into the wetland in the waste stream in the thermal load using a maximum flow rate again and a change in temperature of 10 degrees Celsius and we got that the energy required for removal is around 70 watts per meter squared. This means that yes, we could treat the temperature load in the stream. However, this is a variable problem and due to the nature of the problem, we decided that to be more confident in this summary, we would suggest doing a few things. 
Um, this includes a six month, at least six month temperature test trial to see what the flux actually is for seasonal and nighttime temperatures. Um, planting tall border trees around the perimeter of the wetland would allow for convective heat loss, but also reduce the solar radiation coming in. And one thing we thought about is the nighttime release system. In a Woodburn wetland study, they found a 6 to 10 degree temp Celsius temperature change from the course of the day to a night. So that would be very helpful and we could set up a nighttime electronic release pump to allow the temperature to be cool. So now next, Sarah's going to talk about nitrogen. Another goal of the wetland is to reduce the nitrogen concentration of the wastewater. Um, and as the first team mentioned, the the wastewater treatment plan expects to reduce an effluent concentration of 22 milligrams per liter in 2030. Um, right now, there's no NPDES permit limits on uh, discharge of total nitrogen to surface water, but there is state, state progress towards implementing a limit. We do expect to have a small amount of seepage from our wetland, uh, so our target concentration is the ODAQ groundwater quality reference of 10 milligrams per liter of nitrate nitrogen. And we calculated that the total nitrogen in our uh, wetland effluent will be uh, 8.6 milligrams per liter, and this was based on a infant concentration of 40 milligrams per liter to show um, the treatment in the event of a spike in nitrogen. So based on our sign, uh, parameters, we're able to meet our target. However, um, constricted wetlands are complex in terms of their biology, and they may not always perform the way that we predict. Uh, but we do expect that um, it will be unlikely that the groundwater quality will imp be impacted because the seepage may be classified as indirect discharge. And indirect discharge is the flow through the subsurface to surface water, such as a stream. And it doesn't impact groundwater quality when all of the water that percolates to the subsurface drains to the stream where surface water quality standards apply. And this can be verified through monitoring. This map shows the locations of the drinking water wells and future wells in Benita, um, and the delineation of the um, drinking water protection area. Um, here's our wetland shown in red, and you can see that it's outside of the boundary of the drinking water protection area, and not likely to influence uh, drinking water quality. On to piping, um, here's a plan view that shows the piping to and from the wetland. Um, the pipes are 10 centimeter diameter Schedule 80 PVC pipes and with a total pipe length of 278 meters. Um, the water will be delivered from the spray field to the wetland inlet. And we determined that the pressure at the sprinkler, from the sprinkler system is adequate to transport the water to the inlet without the use of the pump. Um, this shows a schematic of our outlet design. Um, it's a continuous siphon system that's primed with a small air pump and it's possible to add an electronic timer uh, for nighttime release, as Lily mentioned. We'll also be using a gravel layer, a four centimeter gravel layer as an archaeological, archaeological marker. Um, and since the site can't be excavated, we're going to be adding material to build our berms. Um, we're going to have a one and a half meter berm height and a three meter access uh, strip for maintenance around the perimeter of the wetland. And later on, Hannah is going to tell you about the costs of these materials. So one of the things we first found when we were researching wetlands was that in a lot of the constructed wetlands that have been successful in the past, there were aspects of the design that incorporated the community. Um, two of the wetlands we looked at were the Arcata Marsh and Wildlife Sanctuary in California and the Talking Water Gardens in Albany. And so what we try to do is emulate these successes in our own design and look at putting in aspects such as paths for visitors through the wetland, um, making volunteer opportunities, and putting up educational signage that can tell visitors about the history of the Oregon Country Fair, uh, the functionality of the wetland, and also about the native plants that can be found in the wetland. Um, so an important goal of the project was to create a diverse habitat and incorporate native species on site. Since the forested wetland will include both submerged and unsubmerged areas, a variety of vegetation will be used. Oaks, organ ash, and willow trees were chosen for their combined ability to provide shade 
grow quickly and enrich the ecosystem. Four seed mixes will be used to build a solid understory of vegetation that will support the succession of an oak forest and compete with the invasive species that might still have a seed bank in the area, as well as providing habitat for endangered species like the Fender's blue butterfly. In addition, cattails and water willow will be planted in the submerged areas of the wetland to increase shading in those areas, as well as biodiversity. And this appears a quick schematic of kind of how we figured out the planting density. And so this is an example for the oaks. Um, on the far side here, we see how many oak, mature oaks could fit into one acre, and they can have a crown size of up to 30 feet. And then we said, well, about half the area is going to be submerged, so the trees won't be in those areas. And then again, we cut that in half because we want several species of trees as well as an understory of vegetation. So we ended up with a final density of 12 to 15 mature oaks per acre. So now that we have an overview of the technical feasibility and the design plan, I'm going to go into some of the economics of the project. So in our economic analysis, we try to incorporate all the major costs associated with building this wetland. The major material costs that are included are piping and the archaeological marker layer. So as Sarah said, the piping will be Schedule 80 PVC, and it's going to cost about $5,500 for the necessary 278 meters. And the archaeological marker layer will be a gravel fill material at a depth of four centimeters across the entire site for a cost of about $600. Excavation costs were estimated by a construction company here in Benton County, and then we extrapolated those values they gave us to cover all of the construction we thought would be necessary. So this includes digging trenches and laying the pipes and burn construction. So that totaled out to about $13,000. For vegetation, we have a one-time planting of trees at a density of 85 trees per acre. And this includes the oaks, willow, and ash. And it's a high number because we're looking at high rates of mortality and predation when the saplings are young. So that'll be a one-time cost of $800. And we'll also have a one-time cost of aquatic vegetation that will be $300, as those plants reproduce quickly. So we don't anticipate in having to plant more than one. The dry land vegetation will be established in two phases. The initial phase will focus on establishing target species, and then follow-up planting will occur as necessary to increase biodiversity. Seed, seed mix costs are estimated by heritage seedlings of Oregon and include many native species, and seeds can cost up to $8,000 depending on the amount of follow-up that's necessary. The EPA estimate that permitting costs for a project of this scope could be up to $30,000. So as I mentioned, community outreach is really important to the success of a project like this. And right now we're looking at putting in an informational kiosk as well as six signs throughout the wetland for a cost of about $30,000. But our design team is also confident that the Oregon Country Fair has the volunteers and the resources to construct these permits and the kiosk on their own, virtually eliminating this cost from the project if they chose to go that route. And then, of course, safety is very important and something that we considered in our design. And we believe that this project can be implemented in a way uh, to be safe for visitors uh, throughout the year. And so price varies for safety depending on the amount of public access and information that the Oregon Country Fair would like to provide for visitors, as well as any regulatory requirements that there are going to be. So, including the costs of the signage, which may very well come out, the total cost for the wetland will be about $87,000. And to make this a little more applicable, we did a cost analysis to show how much the wetland will cost on an annual basis for two project lifetimes. So we looked at a 10-year and a 15-year payback period at an 8% interest rate. And so in those cases, the wetland would cost about $13,000 a year for 10 years, or about $10,000 a year for 15 years. So now that we've given you the broad overview of the functionality and economics of the wetland, Sarah will just give us a quick conclusion of the project feasibility. Keeping in mind our objectives, our wetland can reduce the temperature and nitrogen to meet the TMDL standards, 
restore our ecosystem function and provide educational opportunities with signage. Um, it's also econo economically feasible with a total cost of $87,000, uh, which can also be reduced by several volunteer opportunities. We'd like to thank John Suffer and Matt Timothy, as well as the rest of the BE department, for helping us with this project. And now we have time for questions or comments.